y'all doing this morning? Everyone good this morning? Yes. yes. Sorry, I just came off our youth fall retreat, which was amazing. So I was pumping up kids all weekend long. So uh, we are so excited you guys are here this morning. Um, I just wanted to welcome you to church. Thank you so much for those that are viewing online. Um, we're so glad that you tuned in with us. I hope that you got to meet somebody, maybe for the first time that's here at church this morning, or got to connect with somebody new that sits maybe on this side that you never see. Isn't that true? Y'all are like, who is on this side of the church? You know what I mean? <laughs> so I hope you got to connect with somebody this morning and just got to see how they doing, because we're all being a church family. Well... I would love to welcome our first time guest this morning. If you are a first time guest, uh, we would like to get connected with you personally as well um, through our church. So we have a thing called a Get Connected card and you can find that card right in the pew in front of you. If you're a regular attender, please make sure to, if you see a guest beside you, to hand that card to them if they can't reach that. And I guess if you'll just take a few minutes actually right now and fill that card out. There are one or two ways that you can get that card back to us. Uh, later on in service when we're collecting offering, you know, just drop that into the offering plate and we will collect that in our office. But I think a great way is I would love to meet you right after service in our welcome center. Our welcome center is out these back doors, down the steps, and right in the center. And if you are able to come out there right after church and give me your Get Connected card, I would not just love to connect with you, but I would love to also give you a gift from our church. So we're so grateful that you are here with us this morning. Please just take a few moments to fill that card out. Um, and as you guys saw this morning, there are great Great things happening here at our church, um, but I'm excited that in this next moment we're going to worship together. So why don't y'all stand on up, and we can take time and enter into our time of worship.
give the Lord a round of praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done.
starting a new series today called How to Be Rich, and uh, I'm sure that that uh, inspires you today that want to be rich, and you're probably thinking, I'm going to solve all of that for you in the next uh, couple of weeks uh, with that series, but all of our groups, we feel so strongly about it uh, going into the holidays. A lot of people overspend, and they get themselves in debt, and I read this book uh, by Andy Stanley. I love the concept of it, and I preached a portion of it several months ago in the Get Real series, and I wanted to revisit it, and I thought, man, you know, November would be a great time to do that as we're challenging people to be a blessing and to give to others out of their abundance, and in the Thanksgiving month seemed like a great place to land it, and so here we go. We're going to talk about money for the next four Sundays, and man, that, does that as a pastor feel risky? You know, it feels risky for a number of reasons. One of them is the risk that I could just absolutely bore you to death. And, uh, how many of you have heard somebody like really good even speak on finances before? And about 10 minutes in, they clearly knew what they were talking about. You knew they knew what they were talking about. They were good. It made sense. But you were starting to nod off after about 10 minutes, right? And it started sounding like Charlie Brown's teacher. Wah, 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 wah. Wah, 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 you know. And so that's one of the risks is that I could bore you with this. Another risk is that I could turn you off. You're watching at home. We're like, here we go. You know, here's another one of those preachers in some church somewhere that all they're about is money. All they're always asking for money. Well, we do ask for money because we want to give it away to people in Jesus' name. But you may be thinking that, that churches and, you know, that's why I quit going, or that's your excuse at least. Uh, that's why I quit going, because they're always hitting you up for, for money. Uh, another risk might be the promise in your mind of something that I can't deliver. After all, the title of the series is How to Be Rich, right? I mean, it sounds like I'm going to give you 10 steps, and at the end of this four weeks, man, you're going to be rich. So let me dispense with that one right away. In fact, I just wrote a little disclaimer. Are you ready? Here it goes. This series in no way guarantees that listeners either affiliated or unaffiliated with Trinity Assembly of God will be rich by the end of the aforementioned four-week series and furthermore releases Pastor Wade Wilson and the leadership of this assembly from any and all expectations of increased wealth by those who choose to use their discretionary time to voluntarily participate in the How to Be Rich series. Right? I make no guarantees whatsoever that you will be rich by the end of this series. But I do hope that a lot of you will feel rich at the end of this series. Because you are. You're richer than you know. And from the book, here's something I pulled out. For example, in our Western culture, we observe a five-day work week. I know that you can always find exceptions to that, but many people work a five-day work week in the United States of America. And think about what that means. That means that most people have to work only five days in order to have seven days worth of food, shelter, clothing, and health care. And that last one, most people in the world don't even know what that is, health care. We complain about if we have enough of it. We take it for granted, but that's unique to our little window in history. What's more, there are households in the United States of America with three, four, or more people that send only one person out into the workplace to earn money. And with that one person's earnings, the entire family can amass enough money in those five days to give them food and shelter for seven days. In many cultures... That's inconceivable, and that's true. I've been in places like Burkina Faso, Africa, where I remember seeing these lady with a little baby strapped to her back, skinny as a rail, out there scraping with a little broom. She was brooming the dirt, and I'm like, what is she doing? And they're like, she's the missionary or the pastor that we work with said she's picking up aggregate or little pieces of stone, which they will, she will take and sell for the equivalent of a dollar a day so that they can use it for paving, right? And that's just one example. I mean, for people like her, it's just about survival 
from one day to the next, out there sweeping the ground with a baby on your back in 100 degree weather, just trying to get the equivalent of a dollar in American money in a day. In many cultures, they can't conceive that you could work five days and have extra for the whole family outside of work. That leaves at least 50 hours a week for nothing but leisure for many Americans. Most people in the world can only imagine such luxuries. Here's a couple statistics that might shock you. If you make $48,000 a year or more, you are in the top 1% of wage earners in the world. You're rich, and you just didn't know it. In fact, if you earn more than $30,000 a year, you're in the top 4% of wage earners in the world. So the name of this message is congratulations, congratulations. Many of you are rich. And yet I don't see anybody standing up today going, Woo! I'm rich! I'm rich! You know, but you could and you should have because on the world scale you should, you should have prob no problems at all other than a handful of rich people kind of problems. Problems that the majority of people on this planet would love to have. Let me give you some examples. Bad cell phone coverage. Rich person problem. Right? Oh, a stinking phone, I can't believe it, you know. Well, you got one, right? And those aren't cheap. Can't decide where to go on vacation, rich people problem. Computer crashed, slow internet, car trouble, flight delays, Amazon doesn't have your size, all rich people problems, right? Rich people problems. Next time you turn on a water faucet, Remember that many people around the world, many of them women, carry jugs on their heads for miles just to have enough water to cook their food and drink with. And many times they drink it and get diseases. They can't imagine a place where there's so much extra water that there are people in the United States of America that spray it all over the ground to water grass. What's that? They can't imagine a place where you could turn on a spigot in all kinds of different rooms in your house that outflows clean water. Now, you feeling guilty? I hope not, because that's not the goal of this series. On the contrary, I'm hoping that the time we spend together leaves you feeling grateful, not guilty. Grateful for what you have. Guilt rarely creates good results anyway, but great things flow out of a heart of gratitude. And it is now November, and it is the month of Thanksgiving. And how many of you want to be grateful? Right? And so I hope that this stirs up a big pot of gratefulness amongst us and that by the end of this month, we're all just saying, thank God for how much he has blessed me, for his faithfulness to me, for the way he provides for me. In fact, I, the way I want to thank him is I want to give on, uh, to others on one day to feed the world. I want to help others, etc., etc. Wouldn't it be great if in the month of Thanksgiving we all felt more grateful? And wouldn't it even be greater if we enter the holiday season with the mindset that we don't want to spend it all so that we have some left to bless others? Many families come out of the Christmas season incredibly in debt after what ought, ought to be one of the greatest seasons of the year. And so I'm hopeful that maybe this series might even challenge and protect some of you from that. Now, this is a good time to share our theme verse. And so here's, here's what I'm going to do up front. I'm going to challenge everybody here to memorize these two verses during the course of this next two months. I don't know how you memorize, or if you do memorize, one of the things I do is take phrases apart. And if you do that about four times, you will have this easily memorized. Now, students... Where's all the high school students? Raise them up. You guys just got back from a retreat. I heard you had a phenomenal time, about 30 students that were there. I got a special challenge for you students. Any student that memorizes these two verses by the end of this, two, this month will be going for pizza with me and Sonia and Jen, Pastor Jen and RJ. All right? Pizza on Pastor if you memorize these two verses. All right? Now, we're not going to go easy on you. You're going to have to put the punctuation in there, everything. It's going to be a test. Pizza don't come easy with pastor. So we want you to earn it 
But let's do, let's read this verse, and we're going to do this every week together. Here we go. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. That's going to be the theme verse all month long. That's, going to, that's your ticket to pizza, teenagers over there, and uh, share it with your friends because anybody that does it, by the end of the last Sunday of this month, there'll be a test. Pastor Jen and RJ, you up for uh, tutoring that test, that exam? Excellent. Here's what I know. And if you have a bulletin, there's an outline in there, or you can follow along on your U version. Here's what I know. Students, here's what I know. Everybody in the room, money won't make you happy. Money won't make you happy. You're like, well, it'll make me a little happy. I mean, not having money doesn't make me happy. All right? But how can I say such a thing? Because it seems stupid, right? I mean, but here's why. It, and I would say, money will make you happy for a little while. Okay, maybe that's a good way to say it. Money will make you happy for a little while. But if money was the key to happiness and an inner peace, then super rich and famous celebrities wouldn't commit suicide. Is that a good point? And I could give you, if we had the time... A very long list of actors and musicians and comedians and athletes and entrepreneurs. People that, I mean, they had bank that would make you just, you know, you drool and say, I can't believe it. And they committed suicide. They took themselves out being extremely wealthy. So there's a downside to having wealth, and if you don't understand it, then you will chase after more of it only to find out that once you catch it or you think you have it, that you are still not satisfied or content. Money is not the key to happiness. So wealth has three negative side effects. I want to give them to you real quickly this morning. And here's the first one. Wealth has... Now, you guys that are students haven't lived long enough, perhaps, to have experienced some of these. But all the adults in the room, guarantee with one of these three, they're going to really identify, if not all of them. Here's the first one. The negative side effect of wealth is that people confuse, rich people confuse being rich with feeling rich. Okay? Rich people confuse being rich with feeling rich. Again, I already give you a great example. If all those people felt rich, they wouldn't have killed themselves because they had millions of dollars. Many of you, based on the statistics that I just shared just a a little while ago, are rich, but you don't necessarily feel it, right? And we want to feel it, don't we? I mean, part of the thing is that we think, okay, money ought to make me feel good. It ought to make me feel content. It ought to make me feel taken care of. Feeling rich is what makes being rich a good thing in our minds. When was the last time, here's a great question, when was the last time you felt rich? Yeah? Never, Never, somebody said. I mean, maybe it was like back when I was, had my snapper lawnmower and I was, I was uh, uh, mowing lawns for widow ladies when I was in high school and I lived at home and all my money was mine and I could take it and I could go buy fireworks and, and dairy cream sundaes and little baseball hats. Man, I was rich. Right? I mean, my money was, was mine and it was there and I was taken care of and all that. When's the last time that you felt rich? Never somebody said it. When you had more money than debt, is that... The last time that you felt rich when you bought a new house or car, you felt rich until the payment showed up, right? Ooh, look at me driving off in my new BMW. And then, you know, a month or so later, here comes the first payment. You're like, it didn't feel as good. Still look cool. You know, how many of you know you can look cool and be miserable? Right? Funny how quickly we can go from feeling rich to feeling stressed. 
And there's a reason for that, and it's one of the keys to feeling rich, and that is this word right here, margin, M-A-R-G-I-N. Everybody say margin. Margin, I believe, is the key to feeling rich. And margin is extra. Margin is a buffer. Margin is the freedom to spend combined with the willpower not to. That's margin. And lack of margin is what causes rich people to conclude that or feel that they are, in fact, not rich, even when they are. Some of you are living rich, but you don't feel it because you don't have any margin. Let me explain some more. Because I'm not just talking about more money. I'm talking about more time also to enjoy the money and the things that that money has purchased. Some of you have no margin. And I mean, this is the American way. I mean, this is why divorces happen all the time. Because people are so in debt, they have no margin left. They're, they're, they've got to work all these extra hours to pay for all the stuff that they bought. And their marriages come apart at the seams because they're not spending any time together. You carry such a, a financial burden that you and your spouse both have to work. And you don't just work. You work extra hours to pay all the extra bills. And it's robbing you of quality time with each other and with your family. And you can only do that for so long before something starts to come apart. You have all, then, you, in this, again, it's the American way. You can drive through neighborhoods and you can look there and say, isn't that a nice home? But it's a terrible family. Right? Because you know them and you work with them and you're like, wow, what it must it be like to live in that home? Miserable, that's how. Miserable. They don't feel rich at all. They feel stressed, they feel depressed, they feel scared, they feel tired, they feel angry, they feel like their life's about to come apart at the seams. And if I just described you and you want to feel, feel rich, then here's at least one of the secrets. You need to consider downsizing until you have margin again. Scott Robertson, are you here Scott today? He teaches a finance class and it's about to end. It'll start up again. on I'm sure he or Alan Retton or some other guys that, that are into finance would tell you this stuff. You, you can have more margin, but you've got to cut some things. And you've got to be willing to downsize. And then you could feel rich again. But if the thought of selling your home or driving a slightly used car or putting your kids in public school causes you to break out in a sweat, that's just more evidence of the fact that you're rich. You're rich. You have stuff. You just have too much stuff. Too much expensive stuff. And that thing that you can't bear the thought of taking a step back or downsizing your standard of living to create margin is evidence that perhaps you're suffering from a second negative side effect of wealth. And that is this. Rich people are plagued by discontentment. Rich people are often plagued by discontentment. Now, some of you guys that are young will still connect with this one here in a second. And I thought of this verse that was written by the, probably the smartest guy that's ever lived. I mean, Solomon asked, God basically came to him with a genie in the lamp kind of a thing. I mean, literally. He was next in line to be King David's son. And he came to him and he said, I give you whatever you want. This is God talking. And Solomon said, I would like more wisdom to lead your people well because this is such a great people and this is a task beyond me. And I'm summarizing it, paraphrasing it. And God blessed him with perhaps insight and wisdom beyond anything that has ever been known by any other human being. And so when he writes something, and it's interesting because all that wisdom and all the wealth that came along with it, he wrote a whole chapter where he's basically complaining called Ecclesiastes. You know, it's like a woe is me kind of a thing, you know. And, and here's one of the verses that he wrote in Ecclesiastes. Whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves money never has enough of it. Well, smartest guy ever. And whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. Because there's always got to be something more. There it is. Discontentment. And here's something that you probably noticed. The person that has, the, the more a person has, many times the more they want. It's a weird thing. You desire, your desire for new and nicer things is an appetite. And you know what happens when you feed an appetite? It grows. 
It grows, right? Appetites are never fully and finally satisfied. I, got, I could give you all kinds of illustrations. One of them's coming up, Thanksgiving, right? Or maybe you've said this. Teenagers have said this to you. I know, parents. I'm starving. You know, we don't even know what that means. I'm starving, i.e., I haven't had anything to eat in two hours. <laughs> right? I'm starving. And, and, and then how many of you have done this before when you were quote unquote starving and you ate a meal and when you finished that meal, you ate so much, you said what? I can't eat another bite. I am stuffed. Don't you do that on Thanksgiving? That's Thanksgiving every year, right? Oh, I mean, are you looking at it? Your eyes are like this bigger hand, the turkey, the stuffing, all that, you know, and you eat like an hour, you know, 40 minutes or so, 30 minutes later, however long it takes you to do it. And you're like, oh, I'm so stuffed. I can't eat another bite. Three hours later, guess who's in the kitchen getting pumpkin pie? Right? Mike Porter that just got up right there. He's going for... <laughs> Mike, stay out of the fridge in the back. As your appetite grows, it erodes your margin. What's that mean? I mean, you've got money and you buy more stuff and you spend more money and now you have to work more hours to pay for all the stuff that you bought and your margin erodes, which erodes your well-being as you are working all these extra hours and you're tired and you're stressed out and you're not spending time with your kids and your wife and your family. Then your health starts to deteriorate and your relationships start to break down and the next thing you know, you are a rich person who feels all stressed out instead of rich. Forget how to be. You forgot how to be rich. That's what you did. And here's one of the ways discontentment gets to us in our culture. It's called upgrades. I love this example. And it's from the book. And, but it's, so I give, uh, uh, um, uh, what's his name, credit for it. Andy Stanley. Yeah, that guy. He's pretty good. Um, it's called upgrades. And this probably accounts for more margin erosion amongst Americans than anything else that rich people do. And here's how it works. Rich people don't wait for stuff to break. Right? Rich people take things that work perfectly fine, usually, and give them away and then go out and buy pretty much the same thing that they gave away, only newer for more money. Right? That's, that's the American way. And so people will drive a perfectly good car, a, a functioning car. When my dad trades in a car, I mean, well, he keeps that thing so nice that it's almost like brand new. And people will drive a perfectly good car to a dealership, leave it there, give the dealer money, and in exchange for a perfectly good car and more money given to the dealer, will drive off in what? A car another car right and if you've ever traded a car or an iPhone or a video game unit because when well, the latest PlayStation came out I mean this one that worked just fine like two months ago it's Christmas I need the new version I need the upgrade this new iPhone has three camera lenses on it see that one with the dog and the hair blowing and all that stuff I need that I need that new phone. I need that new flat screen because the technology has improved. And never mind that, uh, you know, two years ago I was saying, this is the greatest TV I've ever had in my whole life. But now we want an upgrade. And, and so it worked just fine, but now we need a newer, improved version. That means you're rich. You're rich. The newer a nicer trend explains in part why people with cash flows and income streams that we can't even imagine declare bankruptcy. A couple weeks ago, about a month from today, uh, on uh, Harvest Fest Sunday, I preached this message. And in it, I shared this statistic that's kind of mind-blowing to me and really, really sad. 78%, 78% of NFL players file for bankruptcy less than five years after retirement. 78% of people that many of them are multi-millionaires 
file for bankruptcy less than five years after they retire. And we think to ourselves, how could people making that kind of money find themselves financially upside down less than five years after they were rolling in it? And it's simple. Nobody taught them how to be rich. Nobody taught them how to be rich. 50-person entourages like Allen Iverson, you know, multiple marriages and alimony checks and things like that, multiple cars, stuff like that. I mean, they spend thousands like we spend fives. And sometimes that stops because the knee gets blown out or you get old and you're not wanted anymore and they keep living. Nobody taught them how to be rich, right? So think about it. There, I want you to get this today. There are guys with their bust in the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton today. I'm not talking, I mean, guys that you know their names. They once drew multi-million dollar salaries. And today, they feel more financial pressure than you. You're richer than you thought. You're richer than you know, but do you know how to be rich? That's because wealth has side effects, and if you don't recognize them, they become problems that end up causing a lot of pain. You have lots of stuff, but you don't feel rich. You can't enjoy all the stuff you have because discontentment always leaves you looking for another upgrade. And the last one is this, one more side effect of wealth. Rich people often suffer from the migration of hope. This is an interesting one. From migration of hope. And it's summed up in that verse that's going to be our theme verse. Without meaning to, sometimes, without even realizing it. We allow our hope to shift from God's promise to take care of us to money's ability to take care of us. To our, we think, ability to take care of us. And wealth becomes a substitute for God. Wealth becomes a substitute for the giver of all good things. Right? Here's a great question that we'll wrestle with for the next three weeks. How much money would it take to secure your future against all imaginable eventualities? How much money would, it, would you need to, to live comfortably to ensure that you were absolutely safe from the dis- disaster and unexpected surprises that nothing could take you down? I know the answer. More than what you currently have. <laughs> that's, that's the answer. Where, whatever your income stream is, you would all be thinking, well, probably more I mean, you might have a half million. You might have a million saved up in in a Roth IRA or something. But you're going, oh, I need more. So whatever it is, the answer to that question is probably more than what I have. You know what? No matter how much money you accumulate, that will always be the answer to that question unless you learn to put your hope in God, not the money. Fear of the future has a tendency to drive rich people, that's us, towards some very self-centered mindsets regarding money in an attempt to secure our future, which is temporary. I try to remind myself of this all the time. Sometimes you're, you ever do this stuff around your house like I do, and you're painting, and you're like making everything look really nice, and you're like, you know, I'm going to be dead in you know, like 40 years. Why am I working so hard? Why am I making this place so nice? You know, or that kind of thing. And why am I stressing out over this? So It's so temporary. I'm so temporary. I mean, the, the reality of this, you ever think like this? Maybe I'm weird. I am weird. My wife tells me that I'm weird. But do you ever do one of these kind of things? Like two generations from now, most people won't even be like thinking about me. They won't even, a lot, most people won't even know my name. So why? I'm so temporary. You're so temporary. Why are we so stressed out over these kinds of things? But the fear of the future drives us with this self-centered mindset and an attempt to secure our future, which is so temporary, we find it more and more difficult to give generously to the things that God is concerned about, which last forever. Don't store up for yourself treasures on earth, Jesus said, where moth and rust grow up, thieves can break in and steal, but store up in the first bank of heaven treasures where moth and rust 
cannot get to it. Thieves can't get in and steal it. For where your treasure is, that's Jesus. Invest in something that truly lasts. And that's not you <laughs> beyond your, your spiritual life. Our hope migrates from dependence on God to take care of us to dependence on our ability to protect ourselves financially. And we'll talk more about that next week. I want us to read our theme verse again and then I want to close out. Here we go. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to be good and to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. Such great advice. We are, we're so proud of our kids. Mike's back from his donut. And, um, <laughs> we're so proud of our three kids and their spouses. Great kids. I mean, great decisions. I mean... Truly can say that. I, I think of our kids and very few problems that they've uh, caused us over the years. And that's just a, it's a blessing. And they, they, they are hard workers. They've made great decisions in their lives up to this point. They've got great careers that they've come into and they work hard at them. And certainly our youngest son is right in there with us. Travis is serving his country in the United States Air Force right now, uh, deployed somewhere. And we're so proud of him and who he is, and he's, he's different in some ways than the other kids. He's our saver, and we don't, we're not sure like, where, where that happened. But at some point, I think like he was in his junior or senior in high school, I remember talking to him and bringing home a Dave Ramsey book and sharing this statistic that you know there was a certain figure that you could put in the bank at 19 years old, and if you put that in there for a few years, it would start to accrue interest and that by the time you uh, retired, you could be a millionaire. And some of those kind of conversations must have like stuck with him because this dude, I mean, part of the reason he went into the military is uh, like, if I'm going to go to college, I don't want to pay for it. Like, he's smart, you know? It's like, if I'm going to, you know, do... And so that dude, I mean... He is serving and he's all about, he's got a car that's paid off. He's got more money saved up at 22 than I had at 42. When he gets back, he's going to buy a house. He's going to invest some of that money so that by the time he was, the other day he called me from where he's at and the subject was, you know, uh, I left the video game thing. You know, and I stopped by the church, and they were doing this thing with Dave Ramsey, and they were talking about this very issue. And he's telling me all about how he's going uh, to put this certain amount in certain accounts so that he's, he's convinced he, he's going to do this. And by the time he retires, he's going to be a millionaire. And I hope he is, and I hope I'm still around because I want him to buy me pizza. <laughs> right? And we're proud of him. And I hope he reaches that goal. And... You know, but we have a bigger prayer and goal for Travis and all of our kids. And that is that he will not rely upon money, but that his hope will always be in the God from whom all blessings flow. Who promised to provide all of our needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. And we pray that his heart and their hearts will be free from the love of money so that they can be a blessing to others because they learned young how to be rich in good deeds and be willing to be generous to others. And I want the same for you. And God wants that for you. And that's why we're here. Somebody... Uh, you've heard this illustration before that people look around and go, well, why is all this suffering? Why are people starving here? You know, what's, why doesn't God do something about it? And God looks down and says, I did. That's why you're here. You are my hands. You're my feet. You're, you're to be my extension. I want you to do the stuff that I did when I was in the world. I went, uh, you got next. I handed the baton to you. Go into all the world. Tell everybody about Jesus and bless the world in my name. And you are probably rich in this present world, and maybe you realize it, and maybe you haven't. But odds are somebody thinks you're rich. By comparison to them, you are. 
And you probably suffer from some of these side effects of wealth, or your spouse does, or the person sitting down the row from you does, or you're watching at home and maybe you've suffered from some of these. And so if you are in fact rich, the question for you and me is, are you good at it? Do you really know how to be rich? And I hope many of us come to realize how rich that we really are over these next three weeks and that as we do, we continue to become people that God uses to bless those who are in need. And certainly we're off to a great start because last Sunday, you guys together pledged over $80,000 in 2020 to make sure that people all around the world hear that Jesus died for them and loves them. Way to go. And in two weeks from today, on the Sunday before Thanksgiving, you have the opportunity to give a, a, a week's worth, or a day's wage, rather, so that we can help feed and clothe people in disasters, hurricanes, things like that. And every year we do this thing called Angel Tree, and we pick a, a family from a small community in a church. This year it's a Chi Alpha family that's serving in a small post, and they don't have a lot of income, and many times they're by vocational, and we put a tree out in the lobby, and it's so awesome, and they have angels on them, and the angels have stuff written on them, and they're gifts for those families. And we bring them here, and usually on the second Sunday, I think it is, of December, you'll get to meet them and, and, and be introduced to them and we'll pray over them and we'll hand them for a check for Christmas and then they're going to go in the kids' area back there and the kids get to watch them open all those presents. It's amazing. It's called Angel Tree. And the other one is Samaritan's Purse Shoe Boxes. I think they're out there perhaps today where you can bless people by putting items in a shoebox that gets mailed to kids that are not going to have a Christmas otherwise around the world. These are some of the ways that this is what rich people do. We live to give. We bless others in Jesus' name. And I hope you'll join us for this series and that you'll learn well how to be rich. I want to pray for you because... No matter how much money you have, there's one thing that you cannot buy. And that's peace of your own soul. And the knowledge that it is well with God. That was already purchased for you by someone that we've been honoring all morning today. He came and lived a perfect life. Was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. They pulverized this God-man so that we could be he purchased our freedom he purchased our forgiveness that's the greatest message that i ever get to tell anyone anytime and i love to tell it as often as i can because i want people to be in heaven forever with that god who came and died for you now you know about him you may need to research him some more, but here's what you'll find if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the first four books, the Gospels. You'll find that, that, that he came from heaven, a little baby, and he lived a sinless life, and he laid that life down willingly for you. And God accepted that as the sacrifice for all of our sins. And you've heard this verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten begotten. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but could have everlasting life. That's you. God wants that for you. You don't have to die. You don't have to, to go out into eternity away from God. You can know before you leave this place today that your life is right with God, that your sins are forgiven, and it was because God bought something for you. He bought forgiveness. He bought freedom. Would you bow your heads? This will be our last prayer, our closing thought today. You want to be rich? You can know something that a multimillionaire, you can have something that a multimillionaire does not have. Peace in your soul, the ability to lay your head on your pillow at night. I don't care if you're not living in a multimillion dollar. You cannot buy peace. You cannot buy what this man offers. You cannot buy heaven by good deeds and belonging to churches. It was all purchased for you by one man who was perfect. And that was Jesus. And I invite you before we leave this place today, 
If you've never asked Christ into your heart, if you've never asked God to forgive you of your sins, and most of us are pretty well aware that we have them, that we've done them. If, you've ne- if there's any doubt that, like, if, you're, if this was your last day about where you would spend your eternity, man, I, I invite you to take advantage of God's amazing offer, this gift of salvation that Jesus purchased for you. We're going to say a prayer. In that prayer, you'll have the chance to say, God, forgive me of my sins based on what Jesus did and come into my life. There's no more important prayer or thing to do in all of your life. Get to this place every week and I'm like, how do I say it better, God? Because I recognize that a, 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 a prayer that you can pray in like 30 seconds can change where you spend your forever. That's how serious and weighty this is. And you're listening right now and you say, I've never done that before. I've never asked God to forgive me. I've never said, Jesus, forgive me based on what you did on the cross. You're perfect and I'm not. But today I want to do that and I want to know that I'm right with God. Count me in on this closing prayer. If that's you, just raise your hand real quick as I look across the room. Right to left. Count me in. I want to know. God bless you, sir, in the back. Anybody else? I want to. God bless you. I want to know that I'm right with God. No price tag that you can put on this. No price tag. Millions of people in eternity would give anything to be able to trade places with you right now. Anybody else? Raise it up right now. God, pray for me, Pastor, because I want to accept Christ today. I want to know that I'm forgiven. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer? There were at least two people that I saw that raised their hands. This is one of the most exciting things that ever happens around. Happens around and that's when people say yes to Jesus. And let's pray this prayer. And all across this room, like it was your first time, remember what it was like when Jesus came into your life. Pray this prayer with those two people from your heart right now. Pray it with me right now. In Jesus' name. Okay, let's pray. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I'm going to live my life for you. Thank you for giving your life for me. Show me how to live a better life with you at the center of it. On this day, November the 3rd, 2019, Fall Back Sunday, I give my life to Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, let's celebrate before we leave this place today. That's the best news in all the world. Congratulations. If you prayed that prayer, I'd love to meet you down front. Don't forget on your way out today, today's the first day that our Christmas experience tickets are available there.